um, the dominion mandate given to God and the purpose of that mandate being that God's glory should cover the whole earth. Um, we, we talked about that mandate being reissued after the flood to Noah and to his sons. Uh, we talked briefly that the Bible, how clear it is that the earth would be overspread and filled by the descendants of Noah and his sons. And then we talked a little bit in closing of Noah's prophecy regarding uh, Ham's grandson Canaan. And that's basically where we left off last week. Uh, we briefly looked at what some of the nations became of Noah's sons. And as you can see, uh, that, com that comes up pretty well. Um, the Shemites, the descendants of Shem, were generally the, the Arabian nations. Um, the Hamites were basically in the Africa area, even though, and I put a different map on there this week. Uh, hopefully you can see it okay. The descendants of Shem are the purple nations. Uh, the descendants of Ham are the, I guess you'd call it gold or light brown. And the descendants of Japheth are in, in the bluish green color. So you can see the Hamites populated um, the top right portion of, of Africa. And they were in Arabia as well. And the Jephethites um, occupied quite a bit of Asia Minor up into Europe. Um, in that area up there. And I, I, I put another little interesting, a short little slide, which would prove to be, um, which proves to be important today, brothers and sisters, is, you know, the Hamites and the Jephethites tended to be polytheistic nations. And if you look at the little pods of Hamites, you know, Cush, uh, Put, um, not in there is Mizraim, which, is, which becomes present-day Egypt. Um, Cush would become present-day um, uh, Libya and those nations. Of course, Canaan, uh, the inhabitants of the land in Canaan before they were to be expelled according to the word of God. Uh, and Nimrod. And we'll, we're going to look at Nimrod a little bit this morning. And then the Shemites in their land, um, the descendants of Shem, of course, would be Terah and his descendants, which would lead us down to, to Abram. And, of course, the lineage of Jesus comes from the line of Shem. And the Jephethites, um, those nations, Gomer, Mago, Tubal, Javan, uh, will play a key role, as we all know, in the, in the coming, we hope, near future. Uh, these nations will be part of the alliance that comes down upon Israel. So even from the beginning of times, um, I hope to do in our next class, if not our, our last class, is, is look at these nations of Gomer, Magog, and Gog, uh, just a little more in depth. Um, so, the, the, so I thought that was a, a, a cool slide, just so you could see where these people spread out. Um, the next thing that, that, that really didn't click into my mind it, originally as I was doing the class was the count in Genesis 10 speaks of 70 nations. Now, as I mentioned in our first class, I, I, w part, I was a math major. So I, I was curious, all of a sudden, again, it didn't probably hit me till midweek, does the number 70 mean anything here? You know, usually we read it and, you know, uh, I'm as guilty as anyone, sometimes I don't dig a little deeper. So I decided to look at this number a little bit, 70 nations. Um, and again, I put down just thinking, and, and you know what? The answer really didn't come to me till this morning. <laughs> what I think the answer is. Now, you might know, think of something totally different, and that's great. Um, so if you look at the number 70, it, 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 it's a, and I put up on the screen, there were 14 from Japheth, 30 from Ham, 26 from Shem. And the number 70, is it significant? Uh, we know 70 is 7 times 10 uh, equals 70, and se 7 is the number of spiritual perfection. 10 is the number of ordinal perfection, so 70 is the number of perfect spiritual order. Now again, we, we've got Bible verses I put up here, and, and one of them is in Numbers 11:16, um, where, where Moses appoints 70 elders. 
The one I want to look at, though, and a few of these, so if you have your Bibles and you're inclined and want to look, uh, turn to Deuteronomy 32, verses 7 and 8. Again, we're looking at this, this number 70, and is it a significant number and, uh, here when it comes to the nations? And I'm going to change my glasses because I have my low-volume ones, and for me to read anything now, I need high-strength glasses. So if you look at Deuteronomy 32, verses 7 and 8, this is Moses' song of joy. This is just before he, he, he falls asleep. And this is what he says. He says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Remember, we spoke about that last week, how part of the jobs of, of the fathers, the family union, was to pass down the history, the knowledge of God to, to the future generations. Verse 8, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, so he's referring back here to Genesis 10. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. I thought that was pretty interesting. So where does that reference to? Well, if you turn to Genesis 46, that's where you'll find that number. It's in verse 27. It says, all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. Seventy. Okay. That's pretty interesting. Now, we know, brothers and sisters and friends, that, that God just doesn't put numbers in Scripture just to put a number. There's, there's meaning behind these numbers. Okay. So, I dug a little deeper. If you go to uh, Acts 17... Okay, now this was some 1,500 years after Jacob's family uh, had moved into Egypt. And Acts 17 um, says, says the following, and it, it's, it's not exact, but I, I think it's pretty similar. Uh, you remember Paul is in Athens at this time, and he sees all the statues to the gods and goddesses, and he makes a comment um, to the Athenians. So we're going to start in, well, we'll start in verse 24. Uh, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from in every one of us. And then in Luke chapter 10, it mentions Jesus sending out 70 disciples. And Originally, oh, I still do have a question mark at the top of the screen because I wasn't sure what, if this meant anything. Maybe it doesn't. But then I started thinking about my class last week. What was the purpose of, of Adam and Eve and all mankind? What were they to do? They were supposed to spread the glory of the Lord upon the earth. Well, that's what the disciples were supposed to do. They were sent out to spread the good news of the gospel message the glory of God. And I think that's, and I've never thought of it this way, of nations. You know, we think of it as individuals with the disciples being sent out, but the nations, these 70, they were part of that dominion mandate to go out and overspread the earth and, and to, you know, glorify God, to spread God's glory. Now we know before the flood that it didn't happen. And unfortunately, it didn't happen here either. So does that make sense? You know, it was kind of cool. I was actually shaving this morning when the, the thought came to me, 70 disciples, why were they sent out? Well, that's got to be the same reason the 70 nations, you know, according to the Bible. Any thoughts on that? Or you can tell me if I'm off base, if you think. Um, but I thought it was, you know, the, the consistency, the theme of, of Scripture is, as we all know, is just amazing. 
And even back here in, in the beginning of time with the development of nations, it's the same message. It, it doesn't change. It's incredible. Any thoughts? No? Does it make sense? All right. Shaving this morning. That's, I, I got to remember that. My brightest ideas come while I'm shaving. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. So after the flood, um, in the confounding of languages, um, you know, man's rebellion against his maker and, and the course that man set is, hadn't changed. And we're going to look at the confounding of languages in a second. But, but men continued to rise up, not in fulfilling God's dominion mandate and spreading his glory, but trying to attain his own glory uh, here on the earth. And we have uh, important civilizations starting to take place in Mesopotamia, uh, Egypt, Greece, um, nations, empires that contributed a lot of things to, to civilization. Um, but part, doing part of their dominion mandate, but they, they weren't glorifying God. Uh, as, as we read in scripture, most of these, you know, we just read Paul's letter, um, you know, in Acts when he was in Athens. You know, all the statutes of gods and goddesses they had. So they weren't glorifying the true God. They were making their own gods. And, and this would, as we know, become a huge problem. Um, one thing I want you to notice, brothers and sisters, I'm going to try something here, and I, I hope I don't mess this up. Uh, I'm going to use a pointer, and I've never tried this on a PowerPoint. So bear with me one second. One key thing, and, and this will be brought up in our next class or two, um, let's see, ooh, laser pointer. Can you see that? Oh, wow, this is neat. So if you look at the land of Egypt, and we all know where Egypt is, and I was going to draw a circle originally, but I decided against it. So this is basically the land of Egypt. Mesopotamia off here to the right, you know, where my laser pointer is. Um, the Tigris-Euphrates ecosystem is up here. And if you notice in both both cases, uh, one thing that plays tremendously important in both early civilizations are rivers. You have the Nile in Egypt, the Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a future class, the importance, the number of times scripture speaks of rivers. And it either speaks to them as drying up or overflowing. And we're going we're to look at that in the case of, of Egypt and um, the Ottoman Empire speaks of, of a river drying up. So, you know, when you read that in scripture, just remember the importance of rivers to the, to the early settlers of the world and how important they were. And you can see, I mean, to move goods around, you know, with how important rivers and waterways were back then. So that's just a little a little tidbit for the future. Any thoughts, questions? We're good? Okay. Mark, uh, how many elders were in the camp? Was that 70? Was that 70, Steve? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't look that reference up. So you, you're probably right. I'm, I, you, so, so what would you think the importance of that would be? Well, just a continuation. Continuation of the 70 theme. Yeah, and I'm sure there are others I didn't even and find. So there's a lesson if you want to do a look a study on the number 70, uh, that would be cool. I tried to give a class years ago on numbers in the Bible. Um, very interesting, very interesting study. So you know, uh, and hopefully you can see that in the middle of Ham. Um, I didn't put it there on purpose but it, it's aptly placed because one of uh, Ham's descendants, Cush, would have a son. And his son would be Nimrod. And w here we see in, in these civilizations, uh, mankind, the urge to become powerful. You know, it wasn't enough to exist with the knowledge of God and all that he was providing. Men wanted to establish their own power base. Um, against God, and, and we see this early on with, with some of these, as they're called, mighty men. And the one the Bible mentions 
would become a serious challenger to God, and his name was Nimrod. So if you're in Genesis still, uh, chapter 10 gives us a little background on this man, Nimrod. All right. And if you look at verse 8, um, Ham's son Cush begat Nimrod, and the first mention of a mighty man in the earth, this man Nimrod. He, he's the first one to be mentioned as a mighty man. And it says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it was said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And this phrase, mighty hunter, you know, we, we all think of Nimrod, and there's a picture that I, that I found online of Nimrod, um, you know, uh, killing an animal. Probably it looks like a deer or something to that effect. And, and, and growing up, that's all I ever thought of. You know, Nimrod, oh, he was a hunter. He went out there with his spear or his bow, and he hunted for, for venison, for game. And I, I think Scripture is telling us more than that as a, as a mighty man, as a hunter before the Lord. Uh, if you look at uh, Hebrew, in Hebrew the word um, can be translated as tyrant. And if you look I into history, uh, some historians think that Nimrod was actually Sargon the Great, the founder of the dynasty of Akkad, and that's one of the earliest small dynasties in Mesopotamia. Um, Nimrod would be famous for being the first to a man after the flood to use force to subjugate people and to conquer territories. And I think this, this phrase, mighty hunter, speaks more than just the ability to go out and hunt for, for game. I really think, it, it, looking back on some of the history, that it, it means his ferociousness of dealing with other people, his incessant need to dominate and to take over uh, other 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 people and to suppress them. Um, so I, I think that mighty hunter is a little more than just hunting animals. He was, he was in a way, hunting people as well and, and trying to dominate them. Uh, like Cain, we're told he found the city. And in verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom. So we see here, you know, not, not God's kingdom, but his own kingdom. Nimrod was Babel. Okay? In Erech and Akkad and uh, Karnath to the in the land of Shinar, right? The land of Shinar. And I don't have the map back up. Is current Mesopotamia, uh, where I sh we showed the Tigris and Euphrates. That's where these these places are. And he established his own kingdom. And as the population of Babel increased, um, if you remember from our first class, we went over how the population of the United States had gone from 3 million in 1790 to today's figure, and I forget what it was, 320-something million people in 230 years. So population increases can be rapid, all right? So as the population of Babel increased, well, you're constricted in one area, what did he do? He spread out. And he spread out around Babel with these other towns, Akkad and, and so on and so forth. But even then, that wasn't enough. And we find he ends up moving. If you look at the account uh, in verse 11, he said, out of that land went forth Asher. Okay? Now, Asher would become Assyria. Right? Land to the north. Uh, hopefully, you can see it on this map. Um, well, I still have my pointer. So here's where Nimrod originally was, down in Babel. And you see some of the other towns that, that I mentioned. There's Babel right there, Akkad. And, and again, you know, historians can't be 100% accurate on some of these locations, but they, they're general locations. Okay? So he started spreading out to the north, up, up into Assyria. And you can see Nineveh. Um, and Nineveh plays a role in biblical history, as we know. With, with the Assyrian Empire. So Nimrod starts moving up and taking over more territory as his population grew. Okay? Um, so then we, we move on to chapter 11, and, and this is really, you know, we had chapter 10. We're looking now, brothers and sisters, from every account I can read, probably 
I've heard, read some accounts where it says this, this, um, the Tower of Babel was 100 years after the flood. I've read some that say 200 years after the flood. Again, we're, we're jostling a little with semantics, with numbers. So let's say it's between 100 and 200 years after the flood that this took place. Not a relatively long period of time. It didn't take long, did it, for mankind to, you know, s stop God's mandate or try to stop man God's mandate. So if you skip over to Genesis 11, and, you know, as a kid, as a child, I always saw, you know, they want to build this tower so they can reach God. You know, they want to declare their own sovereignty that, you know, we're not listening to you. You know, we can do what we want to do. We can build what we want to build, and we can become our own nation. You know, instead of the mandate of being one nation, one people under God, we're going to be one people, excluding God. And we see that a lot in the world today, don't we? Uh, even in our own country, uh, which was founded for re religious freedoms, we see a lot of the mentions of God being taken away in this country. And 100, 200 years after the flood, they started to do the same. So look at me with me, if you could, uh, at verse 1. So it says, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And verse 2, as it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, which is Mesopotamia, and they dwelt there. Um, some, some text will have it called Sumeria, uh, along with Shinar. So they journeyed off, and, and the scripture tells us, again, that the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And that word language in Hebrew is, is zaphah, lip or exalted language. So remember the plan, 70 nations sent out to overspread the earth to glorify God. So it makes sense at that time that those nations were all speaking the same language. So what language were they speaking? Most historians think it's a, it's a form of, of Hebrew, not current Hebrew, but a different dialect of Hebrew. But scripture tells us here with these words, brothers and sisters, because it sp speaks of speech. And that word speech is devar, the word spoken from the heart. So if you put these two pieces of information together, safar and defar tell us that at this point in time there was only one language that men spake. And it was a, a dialect, a God-given divine dialect that they all speak, and they were all under total agreement, too. Um, so it was a divine language that the, the, the earth, the people of the world were speaking, that Adam and Eve spoke uh, from God. Um, so it's really, and we're told that this language will return in the kingdom age. And um, I probably, I'll jump a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's down at the bottom. Um, Zephaniah 3 and 9 tells us that this divine language will return at the return of Christ and in the kingdom age. So it was something God given to man, but here he's going to take it away. And I'll go back to where we were. So that's an interesting thought. I never really gave that much thought either. You know, you know he confuses the language, thus the term Babel. And, you know, so they couldn't communicate to each other but I really didn't give much thought to the divine language that they had at that time. You know, all for the glory of God, that divine language. Uh, really important when we think of this account. So we get to verses 3 and 4, and, and you can count on your own, but look at all the times. This really reinforces this rebellion from God, brothers and sisters. You know, they said one to another, go to, let us make brick, burned them thoroughly, and they had brick for stone and slime, had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us, build us a city and a tower whose top may reach to heaven. Let us, make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. So that's, what, five? I counted anyhow. Um, you know, no mention of God whatsoever in, in these verses. So they wanted to go out and build a tower. And it, the Bible doesn't say, does it, here in, in chapter 11, 
uh, that Nimrod was the architect of it all, but, but considering the historical evidence, uh, Josephus also uh, writes that it was Nimrod who was the architect of this uh, whole venture to build this tower, you know, and you, 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 could, you could almost feel, you, I can see a picture of him, you know, yeah, we know you destroyed mankind with the flood, but you know what? We're going to build a tower that a flood can't touch. You, you know, can't you? You can sense that, that arrogance uh, in, in him and in man that th they would rebel by building themselves a tower. Well, we know and we, that, God and, that God sent his angels down to look upon their project, and his response was to scatter them. Um, you know, back to verse 1 where it says, they went east to the land of Shinar. So if my thinking is correct, Nimrod's father, Cush, we said earlier, had moved and inhabited the land of, of Af Northern Africa. So, so to me, that means either Nimrod was headed that way with him, was that way with him, which would explain this moving to, back to the east, back to Mesopotamia, uh, against the mandate of God. So God scatters them. He says, you know what? You know, you, you're trying to come together and stay in one place. This isn't what I want. And he scatters them. He forcibly makes them leave that area and, and fulfill his mandate. Um, currently, um, again, another wonderful 70 different languages uh, were in Genesis 10 with the 70 nations. And today there were over 200 nations organized with 6,600 uh, distinct languages and dialects. The kingdom age, there'll be one. That's amazing. Um, we know the project collapses. Um, and, you know, when you think of the project collapsing, w what would happen right away? I mean, we tend to do this today. I remember being in high school. And those of you old enough remember, we, we had groups of, of, of kids in school, right? There were brains, there were jocks, there were, I don't know how to put this delicately, uh, there were those who liked to use recreational chemicals. Uh, we called them a couple of other things, but uh, what else were there? They were, they were cliques, right? I wasn't in a clique. You know, I considered my, I didn't consider myself a chemical user, don't worry about that, but I didn't smoke, I didn't do any of that stuff, Dad. I was a semi-jock, I was a semi-brain, so I could kind of filter among each of the, each of the groups. You all know what I'm talking about, all right? But back in high school, it was a really big thing, the, these cliques, these groups. And in these nations, after the confounding of their speech, you know, your natural thing is to, to go to those who spoke the same dialect you spoke, to hang out with them. You know, I, I can't understand Brother Gordon, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with him, but I can understand Brother Jason really well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang out with him. And that's what happened over this time. They, all, they expanded. They were forced to expand and they expanded with those of, of light tongue, okay? Instead of fulfilling the mandate of God with the divine tongue to overspread the earth, um, God made, forced this um, upon them. And you can notice the image I think I have up there uh, of a ziggurat is correct. Most pictures you will see showing the tower shows a spiral, you know, going up. Um, if if you look at Mesopotamian history, they're, they're full of ziggurats. There's not really any towers spiraling round and round that go up. So the image I have was, was more realistic of what they were building. Okay, any thoughts, questions? Oh, all right. So what is a nation? You know, I, I, I should have probably started this way, um, but I didn't, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that now. So a nation is a large type of social organization where a collective identity has emerged for a combination of shared features across the given population. Right? Those of like tongues got together 
and nations were formed out of them. Uh, language, history, uh, ethnicity, culture, territory, or society. I like the second one better. A large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language, uh, inhabiting a particular country or territory. Okay, Brother Mark, that's great. We know that. Um, and the Hebrew word for nations is goy, and it occurs 500 times in the Old Testament. Uh, the Greek word is ethnos, and that occurs 150 times in the New. And the one thing I want you to remember, brothers and sisters, when you read of nations, it can also actually mean a nation, but it can also stand for the word Gentiles. All right? And as we know, outside of the children of Israel, all the other nations are Gentiles. All right? They're non-Hebrew, non-Israelitish, or heathen. Okay, so remember that as we go through our studies because we'll, there will be times when the word nations is, is, is um, Gentiles. But there are also, um, and same with ethnos, it's translated nations, Gentiles, heathen, or peoples. But now, and this just seems to have happened over the course of 30 years, there are other types of nations, all right? Uh, Red Sox Nation, which isn't doing too well right now, you know. And remember our definition. It's a group of people that come together for a common purpose. That's what Red Sox Nation is. Group of people come together. You know, their descents, any of that could be secondary, but they come together for their love of the Red Sox. Okay. The next one, I can't believe I'm even mentioning, but Elizabeth would love this, Taylor Swift Nation. All right. Um, uh, just a thing that's grown over, seems overnight. Um, it's crazy, isn't it? You see the news reports and, uh, of the, Sw the Swifties, I think they're called, and, and they consider themselves a nation. Their love of Taylor Swift and her music. Um, they have formed a nation. Well, First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, calls the saints a nation. And we, as brothers and sisters, baptized in Christ, are a nation. Our love of God, his word of truth, our faith in him and in his son, puts us in a nation. So we are a nation. So there's all different types of, of things that can be called nations. All right? So I, I thought that was kind of cool uh, to, to get that out there. You know, I... You know, I guess I could have been, back in my day, considered part of Red Sox Nation, you know, when they were winning, and, and I, I, I was hooked on sports like you, you know, I'm sure some of you can, can term, you know, agree with what I'm saying, that sports can be, become a real overpowering force in your life. Because let's say we all look, this day and age, I was talking to some coworkers, and they say, I, don't, I can't watch the news, it's so depressing. And I said, I, I'm here, I hear you. And we're all looking for distractions, things, good things, happy things to take us away from that. And sports was, did that for me. Uh, but doing this study, one thing I, I really, you know, as bad as the news can be, I know where it's all pointing to. And I see some heads going up and down, and that is my comfort now. You know, I, I go into work and, boy, isn't it terrible what Israel's doing in Gaza? You know, and I, I said, yeah, it is. And no one wants to see loss of life. But it's fulfilled. And I'll, Brother Chris wants to say, but it's leading to a purpose. And that purpose is what we're all excited about. Brother Chris, go ahead. This, uh, of course, the Catholic religious system today very much mirrors the Tower of Babel. Uh, and from today's readings, we are told, wherefore, come unto Jesus who suffered without the gate, sharing his reproach. And uh, we very much do that, leaving behind the mainstream religions and the ways of the world, the Tower of Babel. We come to Jesus outside the gate, and we suffer reproach for that because we don't participate in the you know, mainstream affairs of where the mass crowds are going, but it sheds a little light on what that verse was about in the fact that Jesus as the burnt offering was 
uh, offered outside the gate. He was out. He was rejected by the religious system in Israel as well. And and, and we too today follow that. You know, coming out of the mainstream religion, and and, and for that we are uh, scrutinized for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention it, but you know, as, as Brother Chris brings up, Nimrod. One of his goals, Babel, Babylon, all right, was to destroy the order of Melchizedek. That's basically what he wanted to do. Um, and, and, you know, many times we think of Egypt. You know, we think of the land of Egypt. Um, the times that God called, not the children of Israel, but Jesus out of Egypt, out of that land of sin. Um, so, yeah, that's a great point, Brother Chris. And that was Nimrod's desire. And his desire still lives today. Um, we, we get into the book of Revelation and the number of times it talks about Babel, Babylon, um, the great harlot. Um, and, and maybe we'll look at that in one of our last classes as well, how from the beginning of time that is still around throughout the centuries. So, yeah, thanks, Brother Chris. Anything else? All right. So what is God's view you know, there have been some, some great empires. You know, I think of the Roman Empire. And, and one thing I think about is they have contributed great things to civilization. You know, I think of road building. You know, the Romans were famous for their, their building of roads. And where would we be today, brothers and sisters, without roads? Um, you know, I look out here and many of you travel, you know, half an hour, an hour, maybe even more to get here each Sunday. And if we didn't have roads, you know, that would be a hard thing to do. So, you know, thank the Roman Empire for that. Um, but what does God think of, of the empires of the world? How does he view them? And, and, and there are two verses in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 40, verse 15. And as, as a drop of a bucket and are counted as a small dust of the balance. Isaiah 40, 17 is nothing, and they accounted to him less than nothing in vanity. Um, so God's viewpoint of the nations, he, you know, they've rejected him, and this is how he views them, and there's a reason why he views them this way. But even with this view throughout Scripture, and we'll look at this too, God is still concerned with the nations like he is with our individual salvation. Um, you know, he, it says in Haggai 2.7 that God will shake all the nations and the desire of all nations shall come. And that day is going to come when the Lord Jesus returns. The nations of the world will be shaken and they will have a decision to make uh, whether to come and, and bow before the throne of Jesus or not. Um, and in Psalm 72 it says all nations shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. And then if we look in Revelation, I referenced Revelation 21 in the past, but if we look at Revelation 21, verse 24, uh, you think this would be an easy one for me to get to. All right. Revelation 21, 24, in the nations of them which are saved, so there will be nations that come and, and, and submit to Jesus, they shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it. So there will be nations that will be saved, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit next week. Uh, some of the nations, especially those around Israel, Egypt, um, I'm thinking not the top, uh, the, Mo the Moabites, uh, the Ammonites, some of those nations we read about throughout Scripture. Uh, we'll take a look to see if there's a future in, in God's plan of salvation for these nations as well. And we're probably, wow. <laughs> um, so this, I find this page very comforting, as I mentioned earlier. You know, it, it's a terrible thing that's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, Brother Butch has had wonderful classes on, on uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, efforts to want to re-expand Russia to its glory. And I think there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, doing studies on this, looking up articles on some of Vladimir Putin's speeches. He wants to return to the glory days of Russia. 
uh, due to the NATO push. You know, NATO has pushed further into Europe, into Poland, other areas bordering current Russia. He's going to want that land back. And those territories which he's going to want back were some of those ancient territories that we read of in Ezekiel 38. Uh, Gog, Magog, Jeff Jephan, those nations which are mentioned in Ezekiel 38, he will try to recontrol um, before he comes down. Now, whether it's actually taking over the land or those, those lands joining up with him, I don't know, but that's to come. So, but the, 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 the part I'm getting off track is the comfort I get is boundaries of nations determined by God and not man. All this chaos is controlled by God. And one thing I, I, I always think of, you know, man went to the moon back in 69, right, Dad? Was it 69? I was little. I, I can't remember. 69 or 70? Yeah. Sharon's waving. He hasn't gone back to the moon since. He hasn't gone back. Great plans to go to Mars, Saturn. Now, machines might have. But man hasn't, because God sets the boundaries. Man's place is on the earth. This is my thought. You might differ on it. That's fine. But my, my thought is man will never, won't, won't happen. God's not going to let it happen. All right? Man's place is on He gave the earth to us, to mankind. So God sets the boundaries. And if you, we just read this in Acts 17. Um, where, where, where Paul was talking to the Athenians about God setting the boundaries of mankind. Uh, nations will rise and fall. In fact, if you look at the original 70 nations, you know, none of them are still around in their, the, their form back then. They've changed. They've evolved, either shrunken or gotten bigger or changed altogether. So all of these successions... Uh, have been determined by God. And that should be comforting to all of us. And, and I try to bring this message out to others when they talk about, you know, some of them are, are scared. Oh, we're going to blow the planet up. You know, Russia and America are going to get into a nuclear war. China, you know, is, we, we're, we're going to blow this thing up. And it's like, no, no. You know, the Bible tells us differently. You know, God is con in control of all things. It'll get to a point. We know that. Armageddon, we know things will get to a point. But then God's going to stop it all. And we're comforted by these things. Psalm 47, God is king of all the earth. Okay? Acts 15, 18. No one unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He alone rules in the kingdom of men. Um, the, the great verse in, in Daniel 2.21, which we'll, we're going to look a, a little bit at next week. Um, Daniel 2, verse 21. God changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. And of course, this well-known verse in Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. After Daniel has his image um, directed by God at what the image means, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. That famous verse we quote quite often about God ruling in the kingdom of men. Um, Isaiah 60, verse 12. If we turn to that real quick, and we'll finish up here because time is getting short. Isaiah 60, verse 12 reads, and this is failure of nations to fulfill what God had said about fulfilling his glory, what Paul spoke about in Acts 17. We read that here in Isaiah. Verse 12, For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly wasted. Okay? But we all know, and we'll, we'll close here, um, brothers and sisters, you know, when we think of, we know we have a merciful God as well. But mankind looks at it as, well, God's not playing by our rules. Well, 
you're supposed to play by God's rules. That's where the mercy and the grace come in. You play by God's rules. Jeremiah 18, he wants nations as he wants people to turn to him. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. All right? And we saw evidence of that in Scripture. It gives us evidence. It gives us, you know, remember when God told Abram, I'm going to destroy Sodom because of the wickedness and the evil. And Abram made his pitch to God. You know, Heavenly Father, what if I find 50 righteous there? What does God say? I won't destroy it for 50 righteous. And if I remember correctly, that works all the way down to 10. God says, I will not destroy it for 10. And of course, the next chapter, we learn that they were destroyed because there wasn't one fit. There wasn't one righteous in God's eyes. Verse 9 of Jeremiah 18, And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I intended to do for it. Well, children of Israel, a great example of that. And you remember Jonah going to Nineveh. You know, he flees from God. Why does he flee from God? Because he knows of God's mercy and righteousness. He knows that given the opportunity, God will repent of the evil he was going to do to Nineveh. And he does that. He does that. God doesn't want people to, to die. He doesn't want nations to... God's merciful and loving. And Nineveh repents. And of course we know Jonah's not happy about that because Nineveh, that area, was a concern to, to his people. He wanted them wiped out. He wanted God, do you... Do it. God didn't. This verse here. Now it happened 150 years later, you read in Nahum, that you know, the Ninevites went back to their, their evil ways and, and God had no choice. But God wants the nations to be saved, like he wants us as individuals to be saved. And he's given us all free will to make that determination of whether we want to glorify God or we want to glorify ourselves. So, we'll... We'll end on this slide. I'm, I'm taking a little too much time. But this is something, we probably all have this. I have it in, in form, paper form in my Bible. It's kind of getting shredded. My uncle gave this to me many years ago. And we have basically gotten to here. All right, you see where my pointer is? And next week we'll, we'll introduce, and again, this is nothing new. We'll, it'll be very brief. On, on God's plan of salvation for the nations. Okay, and we'll, we'll start looking at that. Uh, the plan is to look at that. Um, talk about a little bit about why is God interested? You know, what's his plan? We'll look at some of the nations, and then, Lord willing, I, I want to wrap up with, with a, a half a class, anyhow, on the restoration of the Garden of Eden. That's, the, that's our end goal, is to get to there.